Life is about constant evolution. Always better today than we were yesterday. Welcome, Ty Smith. Uh, this is The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday, the official Navy SEAL podcast. I'm Scott Williams. And uh, today we want to talk with uh, Ty Smith, a former Navy SEAL. You know, he's now out in the world doing good things in the business community. Hello, Ty. How's it going, brother? Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Hey, a pleasure is all ours. Uh, so we were taking a look at um, how you started out in the Navy. Um, we saw that uh, you, you're out of Illinois. You're an Illinois native. That's is, right. Does that mean Chicago or anywhere else in Illinois? No, I actually grew up in East St. Louis, right on the border of Illinois and Missouri. Uh, most of my family is in East St. Louis, but I do have a significant portion of my family in the south side of Chicago. Wow. So all the way down south. All right. Oh, yeah. It's a whole different world, isn't it, than from Chicago? You know, it is because the east side of St. Louis is the only side of St. Louis that's actually across the Mississippi in Illinois. And on the east side, we don't really have, you know, big city. Even on the, the Missouri side in St. Louis, you know, there's city, there's downtown, but it's not really that big. Whereas in Chicago, I mean, it's Chicago. Downtown yeah. Chicago is, is world class. You know, it's, it's awesome. The, the city has an energy sort of a fire to it. But in, in East St. Louis, we don't really have that. Yeah. Well, I, I know what you mean. I, I'm from the mid, Midwest as well. Uh, so you, you joined the Navy in 1996, but you didn't start out as a SEAL. No, I joined in 96. Uh, I was in AW, anti-submarine warfare, and then I went through SAR school to be a search and rescue swimmer. Uh, and then after that, I actually tried BUDS for the very first time. I was 17 or 18 uh, and didn't make it through. So I went out to the fleet, if that's what you could call it, uh, I took orders to 9545 school to become a military police officer and got extremely lucky, like I always have been. I don't know why, but I took orders to La Maddalena, Sardinia, Italy. And I was nice. there for about four and a half years. It was incredible. I learned Italian. I met some of the best human beings I've ever met in my life. Uh, but I always had the SEAL teams on my heart. So I continued training like there was no tomorrow. And I submitted a package to return to training just before 9-11. And then 9-11 happened and my package was approved immediately. So I got back to Bud in February of 2002 and the rest was history. Wow. And I, was, I guess since you had your package in already, it didn't matter. But since 9-11 happened, did that kind of provide a, an extra motivation as you were going through the, the grueling hardships of first phase? A hundred percent. I mean, I was just as pissed off and angry as everyone else when, when that happened. And for me, it was, it wasn't that I had a feeling of, of payback. Somebody's got to pay for this. It was more so in my heart. I knew I was a patriot of this country and our country had been attacked. The people of this country that, that, people like you and I have sworn to protect, you know, it was time for us to get up and do our jobs and protect those people. And so when I was going through Budge that second time around, my mindset was night and day. You know, I was very focused on, on the mission at hand, which was to get into the SEAL teams and do the job and make the enemies of this country understand that you don't attack the United States of America. There is going to be a very severe price that you're going to pay if you're going to attack this country. I understand after you graduated from BUDS, you went East Coast first. To I did. I went out to SEAL Team 8, and it was awesome. To be honest with you, I didn't like living in Virginia, but I love being at SEAL Team 8. My leadership there was outstanding. Uh, I served under uh, retired uh, Commander Don Sayer, 
my my platoon chiefs while I was there, you know, Craig Thomas and and Matt May, they were incredible senior enlisted uh, leadership and I learned a lot and I got a chance to deploy twice while I was at teammate, once to Iraq, once to Afghanistan and it was everything that I was dreaming of when I was training to become a SEAL. That's awesome. I, I, you know, I've heard of guys going through a school and getting into their field and they're really excited at first and then kind of fizzle out when they <laughs> realize it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Um, kind of like the guy who hears about uh, the, the intelligence uh, specialist rating and thinks he's going to be a spy. <laughs> it's nothing like that. <laughs> but you had a you had a fulfilling first tour. And um, after SEAL Team 8, you you went to the center to be an instructor? I did. I, I came back out west uh, because this is where I wanted to be anyway. Uh, and I went over to to Bud's as an NDOC instructor. And I stayed over at NDOC for about two and a half years prior to taking orders to SEAL Team 1. Wow. And so tell me a little bit about NDOC. Uh, these are the guys who have just shown up to the center um, they haven't entered the training pipeline yet. There's a lot of guys who are listening to this right now who are going to be in that very position one day at at uh, what we call INSWO, uh, but it's the same thing that you're talking about. Tell me a little bit about that experience, some of the things that you observed. For sure. You know, I really enjoyed my time as an in-doc instructor because... In my heart, you know, I, I'm a protector of, of people. That's who I am inherently. But I'm also, you know, by virtue of being a protector of people, I'm also a mentor. I'm a teacher. I'm a coach. I love growing other human beings and seeing those people go on to accomplish their goals and see their dreams come true. And so as an NDOC instructor, that was pretty special because we were the first group of cadre that the students would see whenever they would show up to budge training. And I don't like to consider NDOC as not being a part of the pipeline. Uh, you tell that to the dude that's in NDOC and he's getting his ass handed to him in the surf zone, <laughs> <laughs> preparing for first phase, but he's not really in the pipeline yet. <laughs> I, I bet he'd argue uh, that, that you're wrong because in my opinion, you're, you are in the pipeline. You are already being assessed as a candidate for the SEAL teams when you get to NDOC. And when I went through my training, NDOC was five weeks, I believe, you know, and a lot of guys didn't make it through NDOC. So they never even saw first phase, uh, which yeah. speaks to how grueling the orientation or indoctrination phase of buzz training is. I mean, when I went through training, there really was no difference between NDOC and first phase. In fact, some guys thought that the, the NDOC instructors were harder on them than the actual first phase instructors were. So in my opinion, you know, it, it is a part of the pipeline. It's just something else that you have to go through on your way to getting that trident eventually. But I really enjoyed it because, especially because you know, I had done a couple of platoons in the teams. I, I had an idea of what the teams were all about. And so that was my opportunity to give some of that back to students that shared the same dream that I had when I was preparing to go to SEAL training. And I took that upon myself to, to you know, it, it was more than just being hard on, on, on trainees and, and, and beating them down. It was, no, this is an opportunity to strip away everything that they thought they knew about being in the special operations community and then to build them back up so that they understood, hey, this is what it's all about. You know, I remember going through SEAL training and, and no one really talking to us about what war was really like and what war does to human beings, not just physically, but psychologically. And that wasn't at the fault of my instructors when I went through, uh, because I showed up to Buzz in February 2002. Most of my instructors didn't have combat experience. Those guys were seeing combat for the very first time alongside myself 
you know, I, I showed up to the teams and went into a platoon with some of those guys uh, that were my instructors. So when it was my turn to, to welcome students into, you know, the, the Naval Special Warfare community, I thought it was really important to share those things that I had learned with them in order to prepare them for what they were actually getting ready to do. So, so put that in doc instructor uh, hat on for a moment and imagine that you're, you're talking to uh, a room full of uh, potential SEAL candidates that are just showing up. What kind of advice do you give them? Sure. So first and foremost, if your heart isn't on fire with the idea of being a special operations commando, then this isn't for you. Don't waste your time. Don't waste our time. You have to be singularly focused on making it through budge training or you just, you know, make no mistake. It's, it's not going to work out for you. Um, I, I remember sitting one day and I was getting tattooed by a really good friend of mine uh, who since left us to, to, to go on to a much better place. His name was Master Chief Mike Martin. Uh, and he was a Vietnam era SEAL and he was a badass. And I remember him tattooing my trident on my back and explaining to me that, you know, I never understood why normal people would apply to budge training. Because if you are normal, this isn't going to work out for you. It takes <laughs> someone that's sort of mentally abnormal, someone that's always looking to go against the grain, someone that, that has a fire in their gut for patriotism and what is right. Someone that always has the ability to stand up against any opposition and say, that's wrong and I'm not going to stand for it. And so, you know, but trainees have to keep that in mind that you have to be willing to stand out. You have to be willing to be abnormal. You have to be willing to be on fire with your beliefs in order to make it through bunch training. Because if you don't have that level of commitment, it's probably not going to work out for you. And then the last thing I would say to them is, again, forget everything that you've seen in the movies, everything that you saw in a video game or that you heard your friends talking about and completely open your mind to what the staff is trying to teach you because going through buds nowadays is very special because all of your instructors have a deep level of combat experience and these men understand what it takes to win under fire they have they they have a deep understanding of what it takes to survive when the situation is beyond dire and then also you know, they have an understanding of what it's like to live with that kind of experience. Because like I said, when I went through training, you know, our instructors didn't know any better. They, they didn't understand how to talk to us about post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury and what it actually means to be a gunfighter. So when you get into training, shut your mouth and listen to everything that those instructors have to say because they have some very special things to teach you, not just about being an operator, but about being a leader in the military, in life, in your community, in your family, and also about how you live with carrying the burden of being a warfighter. Yeah, it sounds to me like um, you don't believe in the gray man philosophy uh, <laughs> of Absolutely hiding in the middle. Not. <laughs> Absolutely not. It says right there in the seal ethos, anything worth doing is worth overdoing and moderation is for cowards. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to overdo it. If I'm going to commit to a cause, I become that cause. And it gets 150% of me. There is no such thing as, you know, oh, I'm going to do this a little bit or I'm going to be the gray man and, and be in the middle. Hell no. I'm a leader and lions don't retreat. I'm going to be up front every time. You know, I was um, I was reflecting um, on on your bio when I was taking a look at it earlier, and I noticed that you transitioned from a career that is violence focused into a nonviolent career. Tell me a little bit about what happened after you left the teams and and left the navy. 
So as I was preparing to retire from the Navy, I was also uh, completing my graduate studies at at USC Marshall Business School. And I was already in the, the pipeline to transition over to the FBI. And I was really excited about that uh, because I wanted to continue serving. But also, I had entrepreneurship on my heart. And being at Marshall Business School, uh, it really lit a fire in my heart for entrepreneurship. And I wanted to continue to push myself. I wanted to do things that made me uncomfortable. I wanted to grow as an individual. And so on December 2nd, 2015, when I was actually sitting in class up at USC, uh, the Inland Regional Center in San Bernardino, California was attacked by a radicalized Islamic couple, killed 14 people, injured another 22, ended in a dramatic shootout in downtown San Bernardino. And I just couldn't really believe that, you know, here I was fresh off my last deployment uh, to Afghanistan, which is probably the most violent deployment of my career. And I felt like I was seeing the same level of violence in small town USA that I was seeing in the mountains of Afghanistan. And it just really, it really bothered me that people in this country that are not working within law enforcement or the military you know, got up to go to work every day. And some of those people were worried about their own safety and security in an office building. That doesn't make any sense. And so I decided to do something about it. And so that's why I launched, you know, what was formerly known as Vigilance Risk Solutions. We're now ComSafe AI because I wanted to continue protecting people, people in the workplace, teachers at school, children at school, men and women that get up every day and they go and they build the infrastructure that makes up this amazing country. But it's all about protecting human beings and speaking up for those people that don't have the ability to speak up for themselves. I just want to continue serving. I want to continue protecting people. Well, I think that um, that brings me to my next question. You know, we talked a lot about the experience of the teams, um, Yes, there was a lot of violence on deployments, but uh, back when you were an INDOC instructor, you took a lot of pleasure from uh, being a mentor and helping people. And you spent something like 13 years in the teams. Is that right? Right. Yeah. 13 and a half, 14 years, sure. Okay. And in those years, what would you say you learned Um, in your experience that prepared you for your life as a civilian businessman? Great question. I think one of the most important things I learned is that leadership, leadership is a burden that people should aspire to carry. (laughs) It, It isn't a chore. It isn't a curse. Leadership is your chance as an individual to grow beyond belief if you're doing it correctly because in my opinion if you're not a servant leader you're not leading correctly if you don't learn empathy as a leader you're not doing it correctly leadership in the teams you know gave me the ability to understand how to truly put the welfare the lives the 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 mental health of other human beings before myself. And it's more than just being selfless. It's, it's learning how to truly devote your entire self to the well-being of other people. And here's what's beautiful about that. When you do that correctly, you as the leader, as the individual leader, you don't have any worries. Because when you're giving yourself in that capacity to other people, those people are, they're reciprocating that. They're giving themselves and everything that they have back to you, which means that I don't have any worries because I'm, I'm doing more than just leading. I'm building a tribe. I'm building a kingdom for the people that make up my tribe. And those people are giving everything that they have to give it back to me. And that's just a really special feeling 
when you live that way and when you have people that care about you that much and people that know that you care about them so much that you will give everything in order to never abandon them it's just a really special feeling and i've i've transitioned that level of leadership that that i learned within the seal teams into my life as an entrepreneur as a technology founder because i run my company the same way i ran seal platoons i'm last leaders eat last my team my employees my tribe however you want to call it they are the most important thing and every day if i'm not always trying to figure out how i can do right by them how i can help them grow so that they continue growing for the rest of their lives even beyond my responsibility then i'm doing it wrong but i learned that in the seal teams and so now i do that within my own company and i think that my company is successful not because of me but because of the individuals that make up the company and as long as i continue working every day to grow those individuals whether they're within com safe ai or they're outside of the company i mean that's that's what it's all about and i learned that in the seal teams you know it's funny because we talk a lot about teamwork in the special operations community and we talk a lot about leadership and it leads the casual observer to wonder if the leadership was learned in the teams or really was it a team of leaders who already had the innate um, characteristic of wanting to lead coming together and and somehow working as a team of leaders yeah that's a really interesting question and in my heart i want to say that it's the latter because I don't know a navy seal that isn't a leader inherently. I don't. I can't think of one. And you know, sometimes that gets us in trouble with one another <laughs> yeah. because we are very type A. Uh no one's going to back down and everyone wants to lead. But, you know, that's something else I learned in the seal teams was hey, in order to to be a good leader, you also have to learn how to follow you have to learn how to swallow your pride there is no room for ego in leadership you know so just because you are a leader inherently it doesn't mean that that you shouldn't have the ability to shut up and listen and and listen to other people that are trying to help you grow you know i spent a significant amount of time just listening to other people and and learning from those people mm-hmm. you know i i don't make decisions on my own within my company just because i'm the founder and the ceo of comsafe ai it doesn't mean that i'm the one that's making all the decisions and i know everything absolutely not i know very little that's why i surround myself with brilliant people and i listen to them and i learn from them and because of them i grow and i'd like to think that because of me they grow a little bit too But again, those are lessons that I learned in the SEAL teams because there's always somebody that's going to be bigger, better, faster, stronger, and if you're smart, you'll listen to those people and you'll watch them and you'll grow because you're in their presence. And I think that that's why I've become the business leader that I am because throughout my time in the SEAL teams, I was simply traveling around on the shoulders of giants. People that were wise beyond their years and that had experience that they wanted to give me if I was smart enough to just shut up and accept it and I'm glad that I did. Yeah, I think sometimes uh you know, using your two ear two ears instead of your one mouth is uh is <laughs> is the great wisdom from grandpa that we all uh, should have listened to a little bit more closely. You know, there's a lot of things about um the community that I think are important um, in terms of providing an example and character is probably at the top. It's not just about the physical beast that you are and and um, how uh, you know courageous you are. It's also about being a good person, you know, 
Uh, we don't want the hired gun mentality of, of guys coming in and, and thinking all they have to do is go out and do violence every day and, and it's cool. The teamwork is built on relationships and relationships are about getting along with people. And to get along with people, you have to have some sort of outstanding character values or, or people aren't going to get along with you very well. How important is it as a former team guy down at that platoon level every day working with your fellow type A SEALs, how important is character? It's everything. It is everything. If you can't trust your teammates, then what in the world are you doing there? You know, you're, you're training to go into harm's way with your teammates. There has to be an intimate level of trust between teammates. And it's even, it's not even just in combat. All of the training that, that we do is high risk. You have to have an intimate level of trust within your teammates, which means that you as the individual, you have to have faith that your teammates are always going to be honest with you, no matter what. And it takes a significant amount of emotional intelligence on the part of every individual in order to develop that level of trust. There is no room for dishonesty. There is no room for giving less than 150% with every single thing that you do. So I think it's, it's critical. Well, Ty, I can't think of a better way to, uh, to wrap this up. I mean, that says it all right there. We really appreciate your time joining us today. I hope that uh, some of this uh, reaches a young man or woman out there who wants to be a Navy SEAL or a Navy SWIC for that matter. That's right. And uh, thanks again for joining us. No problem. I'm glad I could help. There's no to hide in hell with jets. If you've been skating through bugs so far, you will not do so any longer. Exactly.